Okay, it's five after the hour. Let's start. So hello, everybody out there in uh, internet land and uh, any MIT students that might be joining us. So uh, today, the plan is to uh, do the second half of this notebook. I hadn't originally planned to spend uh, so much time on one notebook, but uh, it's just so much fun and uh, it's so much fun to play with this notebook that I kind of can't help myself. And then in the second half of this lecture, uh, uh, Professor Dave Sanders is going to talk about how you can invert the maps that we're showing you here today. So just a quick mention that uh, the way MIT works next week, Monday classes are on Tuesday. So uh, what that means is that next week, there will not be a lecture on Monday at one o'clock. There will be a lecture on Tuesday. Uh, uh, so so to, be, to be clear, the lectures next week are Tuesday, March 9th and Wednesday, March 10th. Okay, so the amazing thing about MIT is that almost nobody ever gets confused. They do this uh, every semester or, or every year, every semester, I don't remember, but it, it happens regularly and somehow everybody figures it out. Nobody gets confused. Uh, okay, so uh, just to uh, do a few more uh, nonlinear maps. In fact, uh, I was playing with this map because it's so freaky. So here's a picture of um, myself, Dave Sanders, and my corgi, who you all have gotten to know already. He's uh, behind me somewhere. So here's a here's a crazy map, x plus alpha y squared and y plus alpha x squared. And um, oh, it's just so freaky that what happens when you start to play with these maps. So if alpha gets negative, then, uh, oh, it's just so weird, right? So you can, put, you can, you know, you can, you can, Build these yourself. So it starts off not so weird, right? When you have alpha close to zero. Yeah, no. And, uh, with alpha zero, it's the identity. So that is true. Let's get back to alpha zero. And alpha is zero. And we can bring the zoom down. Yeah, this is alpha's point one. It's practically dead. There. Oops. What did I do? Yeah, let me use the. Go this way. There we go. Yeah, so there's alpha zero. Uh, we can get the pans down and yes, there, there's the, there we go. So yeah, that's not so weird. But then as I start doing weird things to alpha, these are the sorts of things that happen, right? So if I go alpha, yeah, it's just, these are the bizarre things that start to happen. We get, um, so so Dave, what do you think? Are two heads better than one? Because here's the picture that. <laughs> So, so I would like to invite the audience out there on Discord, either now or later, to go and uh, do what I love the most, just play with the computer. I'd like to invite you to put in your own image, create your own uh, function, and, you know, do some art. You know, you know, we can make this an art contest of some kind, right? And maybe display the art that you've created on Discord and share it with everybody and, and uh, you know, post your function as well as, so don't, don't just show us the art, which of course is gonna be the main thing, but if you don't mind, please also post the function and maybe even the URL of the image if, you, if, if convenient, right? I would imagine that there are lots of fun things you could do. I, earlier today, I, I went over and I clicked, what is it? It's, it's image warping on the internet. And I clicked on images and I was kind of disappointed. I mean, here's one freaky image over here. There are a couple over there, but I would think that the art world could do a whole lot better than what I see here. It just doesn't seem, I don't know. I think that we could do a whole lot better. And so I'm going to invite the audience out there to, to go ahead and do that. So the other function that I played with, and it's you can now have it in your notebook, is uh, I wasn't satisfied that there was that, uh, that, that projection, the perspective projection on the internet on uh, Khan Academy. So I built one myself. So here is a perspective projection. And you know you can see here, we could add the grid lines if you like. We could put the grid lines back in. And I don't know, this sort of feels like, you know, the opening of Star Wars, except it's with an image, not with words, right? And you can sort of keep on going here and could zoom in a little bit to see how it's going. And, you know, the question arises, does this count officially as a linear map, right? And we discussed that a little bit last time. 
And this led to even more questions. I said, you know, this didn't, we didn't put this to rest. And we gave a few definitions of linear. I'll kind of remind you of the definition of linear. It was well down here, but you can, you can just click on the table of contents and get there. And so uh, the intuitive definition was uh, the rectangles become parallelograms and you saw they were trapezoids or trapeziums, depending on whether you're American English or British English. Uh, another official definition is, can it be defined with a matrix times vector? And you'll, in a moment, I'll show you that it's not, um, or they're sort of the built-in linearities. None of these will happen. So you know, let's go back up here. So here, here is the perspective projection. And you could see that these are not parallelograms. Uh, it's also the case that if you look at the function definition, here it is, you'll see that it is a rational function, right? It is not linear, right? So there's a divide by. Once, once you have a divide by, whoops, once you divide by, by your arguments, linearity goes out the window. So you're dividing by, so without the beta minus y, this would be linear. In fact, uh, if you multiply by beta minus y, it would be a shear. And in fact, when beta gets very large, you can see that it actually does start to look more and more like a shear, right? So depending on the parameters, but it, it starts to look more and more shear-like for, for large beta. And so it's kind of, you know, this is, this is what good applied mathematicians do. They, they try to sort of analyze what happens for large beta, small beta, that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, this thing, it does not meet the official criteria of being linear. Lines do go into lines, not just the horizontal and verticals, but all lines go into lines. Uh, but it is not it is not a linear map by the official definition, okay? And so, and I'll tell you, it, it is pretty fun to do this with your own images. So you know you can play with the parameters yourself, and kind of see what happens. All right. So now to get to the part of the lecture I haven't gotten to. So here, let let me go. We saw the definition of linear, and uh, I mentioned. Let me remind you. And before Dave tells me to zoom in on my screen, I'm just going to do it. So there it is. Okay, and so I'm going to remind you that basically the definition of linearity leads to the definition of matrix times vector. And I know that anybody who ever learns matrix times vector, they learn it as a mechanical rule first, but this is kind of the underlying meaning that, that uh, if you know where the, 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 the x-axis, the, the one zero vector along the x direction goes, and you know where the zero one, the, the, the vector along the y direction, then you can figure out where every vector goes just by taking linear combinations. And that is matrix times vector. And if you've never checked it out, I encourage you to try it. So then there's the question of what is matrix multiply? And as I said in the last lecture, very few people go back and stop to think, where did it come from? They just accepted it. You know, the, 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 some teacher, a linear algebra class or an advanced calculus class, or maybe an algebra class in high school, if you're lucky, you may have seen matrix multiply and your teacher said, this is how you do it. You, you might've learned to do something with a row and something with a column and you kind of you know, figured out how to do it, right? And, and without telling you why in most cases. And the answer is simply, here, here's the, the answer is to make this equation true that, that if you have a linear operator that depended on A, that is the, the operator that takes a vector to, to A times that vector and you compose it with the linear operator that depended on B, then you should get the linear operator that is A times B, right? That is what you want. And in this little bit of Julia code, I'm just checking that it's true. I mean, I guess I could have, you could, I mean, I guess I could have just put the two numbers if you want to see them here and we can kind of look at it like this or something. You can see that you get the same answer, right? So here's the, here's the vector, however you like to see it. I think this is the better way to see it. So here's, here's, here is, a B times V, right? And here is here is the composition of A and B applied to V. And of course, you get the same answer. And matrix multiply is completely rigged so that this is true. This is the reason why matrix multiply is what it is. And again, I'll invite you to work it out exactly. I'm not gonna do it during lecture, but basically you can check, for example, that if you compose A and B and apply the vector in the X direction, okay, see what it would take for you to do it, you know, first the B part and then the A part. And you'll see that you will derive matrix multiply, right? So do it in the X direction, then do it in the Y direction and you will derive two by two matrix multiply. And then of course, you know, multiplication of higher order matrices is just an obvious generalization, okay? And so here again, you, this, this, here's the matrix version of, of this. 
So uh, uh, just, you know, you just do this and you see that you get the same answers. And here's the pictorial version of this. And maybe that's even the most fun. So why do something with algebra when you could do it with pictures? And so here I have a transformation T1 and here I have a transformation T2, right? And I actually draw the image of the pictures that we have and you know, different random matrices can look very, very differently, right? So every time I hit enter, I get a different random matrix. Sometimes I get one that's squashed and I can't really see the picture very well. Um, other times like, oh, here I zoomed in because, you know, I don't know, maybe I'll get some big numbers, right? Uh, here it's a little bit squashed, right? And so you get all kinds of different effects, you know, with different random matrices, but it doesn't matter which ones you try, no matter what you do, it's going to be the case Oh, whoops, I changed A and B to P and Q at one point. So let's change it in the documentation, right? But uh, it's always gonna be the case that if you compose the matrices, that is, if you multiply the matrices and take the linear operator, it'll be the same as if you compose the operators, okay? So that, that, that's where matrix multiply comes from. All right, next little topic is how did we actually build this demo? Okay, and so in the next little bit, I'm gonna show you. Uh, so here we are in the table of contents, maybe around here, coordinate transformations versus object transformations. And so this is practically philosophical, but you know, I remember, I think it was in high school, somewhere along the line, uh, maybe I, I learned, I don't know where this was, maybe in algebra, you have a graph of f of x and you ask, what is the graph of f of x plus one? And the answer is it moves, to the left. And like that always bothered me because you just added, added should move things to the right, right? Like what, what's going on here, right? I always got that backwards. I still get these things backwards, but the critical difference is, are you moving, are your coordinates staying fixed and are you moving your function or is your function staying fixed and you're moving your coordinates, right? And there were, these are always completely backwards and always requires a little bit of thought, but so, uh, so, so, you know, it, it, this, the, so, so in the end, the math doesn't care, but from the human interpretation, it matters a lot. And so let me talk about the various transformations that actually had to happen to go from IJ to XY. So as you've seen in Julia images here, let's just, let, let's open up a cell and just type IMG. Images, like here's an image, it's an array, right? You've already seen that it's some kind of array like if I go type of image, you see it's a two dimensional array made up of some sort of color things, right? It's an array, it has a size, right? It, is, it has 486 rows and 900 columns, right? It has discrete pixels. I mean, I could look at the, the upper left element by typing brackets and not parentheses. I could look at the upper left element and I get, uh, and I get, oh, is that just an ugly white? That's why I don't see it. Here, let's, let's pick another pixel. There we go, there's a gray pixel. So yeah, I could take any element at all of this matrix of colors and I pluck it out. But when I do function transformations, I want to think, I want to think in terms of kind of spatial coordinates. It's much more natural to do, you know, X and Y right, if you're transforming functions than it is to work on the sort of I and J coordinates that you get with the matrices. And this is the sort of thing that you never think about unless you actually transform between the two. It's kind of funny, but we humans don't even notice this very much, but there's a lot of things on computers um, that humans don't notice until forced to. So there's nothing unusual there, but the row index, of course, you know, goes down and it's, the J index, the column index goes to the right. And so it's, it, it's kind of freaky because um, X comes first and it's horizontal. I comes first and it's vertical. Uh, y comes second and it's vertical. J comes second and it's horizontal. The vertical coordinate is upward. The vertical coordinate here is downward, but the horizontal coordinate is to the right and the horizontal coordinate is to the right. Is that not enough to drive anybody crazy? Well, you have to worry about these things on computers. So uh, uh, here's the transformation that we're going to do. Whoops, let me, can I just do this? I'm gonna make it smaller so you can see this, if I can. Oh, let's see who's gonna let me do that. I'm having a little trouble. 
I'm having a little trouble. Oh, that's odd. I don't know why I can't zoom right now. Dave Sanders is going to get very angry at me if I can't zoom in. Let me try zooming in with the this thing. Oh, that's working. Okay. I don't know why the keyboard shortcut's not working on me. But here we go. So uh, here's a picture of the coordinate transformation that we need. So I've got this Corgi picture. It's just a rectangle. It's a, it's a matrix, right? It's a, it comes in as a rectangle. It has so many rows and so many columns, okay? I want to imagine this picture as living on an array, like a unit square that goes from minus one to plus one. Okay, that seems like a very cool, convenient coordinate system. This is what I have. This is what I want. Now, I've got a little bit of a problem because this very, very long Corgi is not in a square picture at all, right? It's kind of landscape, it's not portrait. So I have to inscribe it in the square, leaving a little bit of extra room above and below if I want to work on a square. So first of all, what I have to do is inscribe this in a bigger square. When I do it up here, you have to imagine, there's nothing real about it. I have to imagine rows going backwards, you know, back to zero, minus one, minus two, minus three, right? And um, in this, and I also have to have rows that go beyond the rows of the image, you know, rows plus one, rows plus two, rows plus three. I have to keep on going until this is columns by columns. If I had a portrait picture, it would end up, I'd have to make it rows by rows. All right, so that's one thing I'd have to do. Uh, but the other things I have to do is swap the X and the Y with the I and J in the reverse the direction. And so the great thing about having infrastructure is I can do this. So I can scale, if, if this is an M by N image, or actually M is the maximum columns and rows. If this, is, if this is now an M by M image, I could scale from this two by two image to an M by M image by just scaling by M over two. Oh, and I have to flip the Y coordinate because it was upside down. No problem, I've got it ready. And I have to swap the uh, X's and Y's. That's no problem. Oh, and there's one other thing. The middle of this corgi is halfway with the rows. I mean, I'm probably have to worry about evens and odds, but halfway with the rows and halfway the columns. And I would like to center the corgi. So no worries, I have a translate function. And so here's a bit of a computer science idea that's kind of a little bit different from the one-off engineering to the really good computer scientist. The one-off engineer, what he does, and I do this all the time too, you'll, you'll even find it in my code, just kind of hard wires. In other words, you see this cool sort of combination of composed operations? You know, the one-off engineer doesn't do that. The good computer scientist does. The one-off engineer- you, Can you zoom in again to your notebook, please? Okay, so I tried to catch you on this, but you, you keep catching me back. Yeah, so I'm, I'm emphasizing this method of writing code, okay? So it's no longer about getting the answer right, okay? It's about doing it with style. So you see, I could have just worked this out, and in fact, in my first version, I probably did, where I just sort of hardwired all this. But the problem with hardwiring is, sure, I've got it working, and I've got it working here, and if my mindset is, all I want is this thing to work, I'd be happy. But you know, I can now do, but you see, a good computer scientist anticipates the future. They say, oh, but I might want to flip other things. I might want to swap other things. And so you create the swap function, you create this flip function, so that you can now use it over and over again, and thereby you save a lot of work later on, okay? It's not that different from when I might tell students and even faculty to bookmark the, uh, bookmark the, the, the links for this, for this class. So you don't have to, next time you're gonna need it, you don't have to go looking for it, right? And so what you always wanna do is anticipate the future. You know, and the, the, the funny thing is that sounds complicated at first because you have enough to think about when you do it. Uh, when you do it right now. But the truth of the matter is, is that you make a habit of this and all of a sudden you find that so much works better for you into the future. So there's my little bit of computer science advice right there, just because we name these functions instead of hardwiring the answers. I think I could have even done a better job. Uh, but some of the other things you have to do is uh, not only do you have to apply this to every pixel, but you also have to make it an integer because that's what matrices require. And then finally, um, if you're in bounds, you could grab the color of the pixel, but if you're out of bounds, you, you need to make it, a, you know, I went back and forth between black and white. You could try what it, you can make it whatever color you like. Um, but so that's why the background now is black. If you go back to these pictures here, the background is black here, just for fun, I can switch back to white. So Dave would tell me I shouldn't scroll, but I should open up another image. But here, let's, let me make it white now. So here, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll do it the Dave way. 
So here, let's 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 open up this a, a cute little thing in Pluto is you actually can have another image open. So here, let's let's open it over here. Now you can see the background is white. Here, let's go back to this over here. Just fun things you could do. Right. So here, if I comment out the white and make it black, there's the black background. Comment out the black and make it white, and there's the white background. Okay. So you could change it between the buffers, and it just works. Pretty fun to do once you sort of master doing these sorts of things. Again, always play with the code while you're a student, especially. Uh, oh, oh, I'm not sure the screen showed up, but anyway, yeah, always play with code. Get make think, ask yourself fun questions. That's always the best. Okay, where were we? So, so that's the transformation between x, y, and i, j. So let's bring that back over here. Uh, so now I want to talk about inverse functions. Okay, so inverse functions. So an inverse function, and this is sort of a mathematical definition, says that if you have f is some function, it could be from two vectors to two vectors, but that's not particularly important. We have an inverse denoted by the superscript minus one, but it's pronounced usually as f inverse. It's the property that undoes, that undoes the effect of f. That is, if you apply this inverse function and then apply f, you get back to where you started, or you could do it in the other order. You could apply f and then f inverse. And this equation uh, is something that should be true at least in some region of, it might be true in the whole plane, but it might be true in some region of the plane. And so, for example, um, scaling, here, here's a random vector, but if you scale up by two and then scale by a half, then the result is that you've, gone nowhere, right? So I'm checking that the transform vector is the same as the original vector. Okay, so uh, you you can also try uh, it backwards, scale of a half, compose a scale of two, and you could see that it comes out to be the same as the original vector. Again, I could have, sometimes I actually like to look at numbers. You could actually see the numbers coming out the same if you want to. And so, uh, you know, here's, here's, that the vector going in and the vector going out are exactly the same. Okay, I mean, there are a lot of examples I could come up with. You can rotate by 30 radians. I don't even know what that means. That's like, that's not quite 10 pi, but less than that, but anyway. And then you can rotate by, by uh, does somebody in, in the chat want to tell me what to put in here to, to make this a, a no-op, an, an operation that does nothing? This is where I miss like the large audience. Uh, anybody want to tell me? I'll just do it. Minus 30. Minus 30 will rotate. Uh, minus 30 will rotate. Uh, which way? One of them's clockwise, one of them's counterclockwise. Yeah, th uh, 30 is counterclockwise. So the first one's clockwise. Okay, so that again is an inverse operation. So what does inverse really do? Well, uh, as a matrix, you see, it, it's when we do it with matrices, we want to find the matrix that undoes the, the, the transformation defined by that matrix. So ultimately, what we would like is B times A and A times B to be the identity. And this is what we call a matrix inverse. Okay, and so uh, in Julia, you can just type in Vave. There's a formula out there if you want to know the explicit formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix. It, it's something you learn in a linear algebra class. But basically what I want to do is just show you that, again, we can, we can do it with a comma so you can see the numbers, that uh, the linear operator, if you apply A as a linear operator and then apply the same linear operator to the inverse of A, you're going to get the no op, right? The I love that word no op. You know, nothing happens. No operation, right? That's that that's a, a no op. Uh, you know, I, I almost you know feel like um, when my we go to the grocery store, we get a lot of food, and then by six days later, it's all eaten up. That's a no op, right? The combined result of buying the food and eating it is all, maybe not completely a no op, but mostly a no op. Okay. So what about inverting nonlinear transformations? Well, that seems like a much more complicated thing. Right, it, to, to be able to invert a nonlinear transformation. But here, let's show you that we can do that in Julia as well. It might be a little slower, but we can do that. So here, let us let me go back to the top of this notebook here where we played with transformations. Maybe we'll pick a different picture and a different, just to make it interesting. Here, let's, uh, uh, what's a good, what's a good, 
um, wait, what's a good image here? Let's see. So, um, here, let's, let's do it here. All right, I'm going to go back to, I think I'm gonna go back to this image, the, the original set of corgis that I used before. There they are. No, uh, wait, where'd my corgis go? That's weird. Okay, how about this corgi then? Is that gonna work? All right, I give up. Let's go back to this one. We'll use this one. Okay, so my corgi seem to have disappeared. But in any event, here, let me make this shorter. And let's take a, um, let's take a nonlinear shear. Let's do a nonlinear thing just to show you that it's possible. So let's do a nonlinear shear with parameter alpha. And what? I don't know what's happened. This worked like five minutes ago. Oh, oh no, I can't have two of these. There we go. That's that's my error. My bad. Sorry. Okay. So let's see. Here's some here's some nonlinear shearing of you know of, of this picture. I don't know what's a good version to use, but here, here's a nonlinear shear. And here is an inverse function that we defined a little bit below. And in just a little bit, uh, Dave's going to tell you how this is implemented. But you see, we can actually calculate a we can calculate the inverse of this nonlinear shear. And did it do anything? Did it work? Let's take a look again. I'm still thinking. Uh, okay, so here you can tell because you can tell because of the dotted lines on the left of the image. Oh, oh okay. I thought I saw it stop. That's when it, that's yeah, when no, it's processing. I, yeah, no, I thought I saw it stop, but that's my bad. Okay, yeah. So it's still computing the inverse. Okay, and there you see it kind of flipped the other way. And what I'd like you to do is remember this picture. You don't have to remember it very. I'm going to actually switch the comment to the nonlinear shear of minus alpha, which I know happens to be an analytic inverse. So I'm going to comment this out and I'm going to put this one in and you can see nothing has happened because the inverse actually computed it directly. Okay, so um, let me just do one more little thing and then I'm going to hand it over to you today. Let's kind of put together the whole story of how this thing works. Uh, so here's sort of the big picture of transforming images as we do it in this code. Can you zoom um, in again? And we're going to zoom in again. Yes, we will. I think what we need to do is implement a automatic Dave Sanders zoom detector. It'll know <laughs> when I need to zoom in and when I don't. That's what I really need. Okay, so, uh, so, so here's the big picture. We start out with some uh, long corgi and then we're gonna embed it, like I said. It's gonna get warped in some way and this is what we're going to display. So how does this really work? Well, as I said, we're going to apply T inverse. We're actually going to go backwards. We're going to go pixel by pixel in this image here. And we're going to find out what the color is, where it came from. So for example, here are the core, suppose I'm up to this pixel, right? So imagine I'm just stepping through one by one by one here and I get to the corgi's nose. And I want to know what color it should be. Well, what I do is I apply the map onto this square. This is a conceptual map from the minus one, minus one to minus one, minus one. And look, it landed over here. And then here, the, we see there was a black nose. So that's how I know to put the black color here. Okay, and so I do this pixel by pixel. If I land outside the corgi, I just you know get a background color like white. Okay, if I land inside the corgi, I use that color. Okay, and then finally, this is an abstraction in a way. This is just an idealization from minus one to one. So what I have to do is render it again as an image. In this code, we've actually hardwired it. Uh, I'm probably not the best idea. But we, uh, we, 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 we then took this and we turned it into an 800 by 800 image, which you can now, uh, you know, which you can now index into and do whatever you would like to in the future. Okay, so there's this whole picture of what's going on that uh, is, in some sense, the input and output happens out here, but the actual sort of math of it all happens down here. And this is very, very common for transformations where you, you you turn something into, into sort of an idealization, you work on that idealization, and then you go back to the thing that, that really works. Now, of course, funny things could happen if you've already seen it. For example, uh, 
T inverse of two points can collide, and that's when you get some of these visually interesting, you know, maybe even freaky diagrams. And so, uh, if I'm moving along and I get to this pixel and it goes here, and then I move learn further here, and I, this pixel also goes here, right? I mean, functions have the property, you know, when you apply T inverse, it could be that that you know, that the T inverse of this and T inverse of this are the same. I mean, if you want a one dimensional example, think of F of X equals X squared, right? Uh, if, if you took minus one or plus one or, or minus seven and plus seven, you know, you're gonna end up in the, with, with 49, right? It, it, they're both gonna land in the same place. So functions can and will point to the same place. And when you do that, you get these sort of funny looking effects. And somewhere in the middle, like, a, I mean, just to go back to the analogy of F of X equals X squared, Somewhere there's like that middle point, x equals zero, that's kind of neither positive nor negative, right? It's the one place where it's the one, it's the one value of square that doesn't have a plus and a minus, right? And that, you could tell that's gonna to correspond to what's going on somewhere down the middle here where, you know, the, where Philip's paw is sort of connecting and, you know, here somewhere in the middle, there's like one, one pixel rather than it appearing twice, if you see what I mean. Okay, and so that's kind of why these things can happen. and. Uh, and, and so, uh, so you might ask, why are we doing this backwards? And the answer has to do with the discretization of pixels, that it's kind of a lot easier to go pixel by pixel by pixel and see what color it should have come from. When you try to go forward, which is something that you know, we've done and we played with, you can get gaps because it could, the pixels spread out, or you can get collisions that, that are different from these collisions. They're just, things are compressing a lot closer. And so you got to deal with that. Like if you've got gaps, you can interpolate, um, and if you've got sort of the, the, these collisions, you can take an average, but I wasn't ready to write all that software just for this kind of purpose. So it was easier to go backwards. And that's, that's why, in fact, all the maps here, as you saw from the beginning, and this is the last thing I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna pass it on to you, Dave. Uh, all the maps here, as you noticed, I called them T inverse, and they really are going exactly in the wrong direction, right? And they do have the property that, that does, I'll just say one more property out loud, which is that, that if I have, uh, it's always the case that if I have inverse of T1 uh, composed with T2, just like matrices, but this is true for all functions. If I have the inverse of T1 composed with T2, it always goes backwards. It'll always be the case that it's inverse of T2 um, composed with the inverse of T1, right? And that's, you know, you're supposed to think about, you know, putting on your shoes and socks, right? You you put on your socks and then you put on your shoes, but then you take off your shoes and then you take off your socks, right? I mean, it's that sort of thing going on. Okay, enough of shoes and socks. Dave, you wanna take over? Sure. And talk about how do you solve these, how do you solve nonlinear equations? Yeah. Thanks, Hi, Dave. everybody. Uh, I need to turn my camera on. Okay, can you see me and hear me? Okay. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about how do we actually do this inverse that we that Alan was just talking about? So basically what we're trying to do is solve some kind of equation and um, that will uh, be like finding an inverse. And to do that, we're going to use this uh, algorithm called the Newton method that indeed Newton had a at least a version of. And it's been rediscovered a lot of times and it's, it's used all over the place uh, nowadays. Is it true so, that Newton wrote the code in Julia? Is that, I heard a rumor. I think he did, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, so what does it mean to, to calculate an inverse? Just to reiterate what Alan was saying. So, you know, we have something like um, y is f of x. So you can think of x as the input and y as the output. But what if we are actually given y and we want to reconstruct x? So we want to go backwards. Uh, so now, sort of we're given the output and we want to find the input. In other words, the input and output, if you like, are swapped over. And so we actually want to solve this equation. And this equation, you know, this, this F might be one of these complicated nonlinear transformations of an image. So the X and Y here might be vectors in two dimensions or in N dimensions. So how are we going to do that? In general, it's not actually possible as Alan showed, but uh, we'll, so we'll try to do it. And so uh, we're going to use the Newton method. So uh, suppose we want to solve an equation like f of x equals g of x in, for one variable x. Uh, so a, a useful thing to do is actually just rewrite that equation so that all of the terms in, which involve x are on one side. And so we'll get something like h of x equals zero. 
So in this case, we can do that just by defining H as F minus G. And then we'll call, uh, so we want to solve this equation and that uh, a solution of this new equation, H of X equals zero, will give us an, a solution of the previous equation. And a, a value of X for which this holds is called a root or zero of the function H. So H of, I'll call it X star. So H of X star equals zero. It's a special value where of X where the function it becomes zero. So how can we actually go about finding one of these zeros or roots and uh, thereby solve this one dimensional equation? So that's what the Newton method does. There are various methods to find roots. They're called root finding algorithms. Uh, but the Newton method is, is sort of special and it's very, it's very neat. So let's look at what it does and then we'll try and understand how it works. So here's a function. It's just x squared minus two, one of my favorite functions. And so we know that um, you know, when I try and solve that function equals zero, uh, there is a, a, a value of x where that occurs. In fact, there are two, plus the square root of two and minus the square root of two. And you can just about see that on this graph that where it crosses this horizontal line, is about 1.4 and it's about minus 1.4, which are the square root square roots of two. And so we want to actually find that, but that point without knowing where it is. So we're gonna start somewhere, which we'll call x zero. And then uh, we're gonna do the following. So here's an animation using uh, plots.jl for the plotting and, and uh, Pluto's interactive uh, you know, uh, facilities for the interaction, of course. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna move upwards until we hit the function, the curve, the graph of the function. So at this point, where are we? We're at x zero comma f of x zero. So the value of y here is f of x zero. And then we're gonna construct this tangent line at that point. Uh, so how do we do that? We know that the slope of that tangent line is the derivative of the function at that point. So we are going to need the derivative uh, to run this algorithm. And I'll talk a bit. Uh, so Alan's already mentioned automatic differentiation, and that's what we'll use. You could do this with finite differences instead. And um, so now what are we going, we're going to do is follow that tangent line down to the x-axis. So basically what we're trying to do really is actually follow the function downwards. We, we, if, we could, if, if we could slide along this function, you know, as I'm sort of indicating in this nonlinear way, like a, as if it was literally a slide in a children's playground, we, we would actually, you know, slide down and hit the x-axis, but we can't do that. And so instead, we'll slide down this linear version, or if you like affine version of the function. So we're approximating the function by this straight line. We're gonna slide down the straight line instead because we know how to do that. I'll show that in a minute. And so that gives us a new estimate x1 of um, the root, right? So this x0 is like a guess or approximation of the root and we want to improve that. So here's an improved version. And now what can we do? Well, we can just do the same thing again. So we'll take that x1 and we'll go up to the function at you know f of x1 and we'll construct the new tangent line there and slide down that new tangent line until we hit, hit the new root with the new guess x2. And we'll carry on doing that. And you can see that very rapidly what happens is that all of these labels and all of the points accumulate on top of each other. And that's why we get this thick darker line for the tangent. And so we've actually found a root or found you know, a very good approximation of the root. So that's exactly what the, how the Newton method works. That is what the Newton method is. So let's look at that again on a um, different function, which is now a cubic. So we know that it has three roots. Here's the, the formula. And we're gonna do exactly the same thing again. So let me move these slide, uh, the sliders down. So I'm gonna do exactly the same thing. We'll start at this point over here. Uh, let me even move it a bit further out. And um, now we'll start doing the Newton method exactly like we did before. And we can see that indeed, oh great, it converges to that root over there. But what happens if, you know, this, this root here, what happens if I start somewhere over, you know, over here. So we can actually move X zero around. So let's, uh, unfortunately the picture also moves, sorry about that. So let's um, start with X zero. Oh dear. Uh, let me uh, try and fix that. Okay, there we go. 
so <clears throat> okay, that's better. So let's move x0 around. So here's x0. I'm going up to this point, And when I take its intersection, you see that I have failed to sort of slide down this curve properly. And now I've gone to this other point over here. And as I carry on uh, with more and more points, actually this one now sent me zooming off over here. And um, you know the intersection is, is over here. So you can see that the Newton method actually can go quite wrong. And um, it, whereas if I start over here, I actually zoom into this route. So you, 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 so the Newton method is you know, great if you start close to a route, but if you're too far away, it can actually do nasty things. Okay, so let's try to understand what's going on. So um, uh, there has just been a new package release called symbolics.jl, and uh, we, we can do actual symbolic calculations in Julia. So instead of numerical calculations, we'll do symbolic calculations. So let's define two variables called Z, zeta and e, Z and eta, sorry and a function which is x to the m minus two. So it's like x squared minus two, but I can change the power. And I'll define f primed of x to be the derivative of f at x using this forward if package. I can write that prime as backslash prime tab. Okay, so for example, let's start with m equals one. So my function f of z just gives me z minus two, right? So I have x to the power one minus two, and I'm applying it at the point z, that gives me z minus two. And z here is a symbolic thing. So I literally get the symbolic expression z minus two. And now I'll, I'll do f of z plus eta. And that gives me, of course, z plus eta minus two. And um, great. And so what is the derivative at z? Uh, it's, it's one, the derivative of this function at, at z uh, is one. And so if I take those sort of linear or affine approximation to this function, which is just you know, wherever f takes the original point z, and then this, so I'm thinking of eta as a small perturbation. So it's, eta is supposed to be, you know, we're, we're thinking of uh, sort of moving a little bit away from z, then approximately we expect f of z plus eta to be uh, this, this expression. So that's basically the dip by the definition of the derivative. So eta times f prime of z. And you see that in this case, when uh, m equals one, the function is linear, and so the derivative gives me actually everything. And so when I subtract this linear approximation from the from f of z, I actually get zero. Now we're going to let me just zoom out a bit, maybe. Now I have Alan's problem. Uh, same problem as uh, we've been saying all, all the time that the screen's not big enough. So uh, now I'm going to change m to two. So now my f of z is z squared minus two. And when I do f of z plus my little bit, my little perturbation eta, I get called z plus eta all squared minus two. And you can see that you know, we're doing symbolic symbolics again. And now what I'm going to do is actually expand that. So I wrote this little expand function. Hopefully that will be included in the package. And so that just uh, expands out these brackets. And so now I have a sort of polynomial expression. And you see that I have this, this eta squared and the z times eta. So the thing is that eta we're thinking of as being, so this is an exact expression right now, but now we're thinking, going to think of eta as being small. And so eta squared is tiny. This is, you know, the, these arguments that, you've had, that you saw in calculus one, except that now we're actually doing it symbolically uh, on the computer. And so, um, so what I want to do is ignore the eta squared term. So I could, there are various ways I could do that with the package. Um, I didn't uh, manage to, to actually do it in time for, for the class. So <clears throat> let's calculate, let, let's ask forward diff what it thinks the derivative is. And it thinks the derivative is 2z. So the derivative of this function is indeed 2z at the point z. And now we're going to construct this linear approximation where we take just f of z plus eta times the derivative at z. And we get this, this thing. And you see that there are no, there is no eta squared in this expression, of course. So the difference between f as z plus eta with this linear expression is all of the nonlinear non terms. And so, you know, we can actually see as symbolically that indeed the effect of this derivative, the way it works is to basically ignore all the nonlinear non terms. And we can carry on, you know, changing m and you can play with that later. And um, everything updates automatically and you can see that, oh yes, uh, indeed all of the you know, again, here, they're, they're all the nonlinear terms in eta. 
are what's left after I have this linear approximation, yeah, linear in eta. Okay. So now let's use that to uh, understand how to how the Newton method works. So basically, if we go back to this original um, picture, something like this, and uh, so what are we actually doing? So you know we know that the slope of the straight line is f primed at this point x zero, the derivative at x zero. That's the slope, and so using elementary geometry, we can work out. Given that slope and the height here, what is this distance between x0 and x1, which I'm calling delta? And so we can write that mathematically as follows. So x1, I'm going to define to be x0 plus delta. x0 is my initial approximation that I'm just guess, you know, I might take 37 as my initial position that I'm guessing for my root. And now delta is an unknown distance that I want to find. And once I found delta, I'll call x1, x0 plus that, that, that change. And so I want x1 to be a root. And so I'm going to impose that f of x1 is 0. And that is a condition now on delta. So f of x0 plus delta is, appro is approximately 0. And so now if delta is small, then the idea is I'm going to expand this um, using the definition of derivative as this. Right? So that's basically what we just did. We showed with the symbols that when I do this expansion, at least for polynomials, I get this sort of sequence of terms with which might have higher powers of delta. And I'm just going to throw away all those higher powers and be left with just the terms with no delta in the constant and with one you know, uh, factor of delta. So this is a term that's sort of linear in delta. And so once I have this formula, now I can you know, use elementary algebra to isolate delta to rearrange the formula and I get delta is minus f of x0 divided by the derivative at x0. And so that is the expression that you would get from elementary geometry as well for this distance delta in this, the triangle I just showed. And so when we put that in back in the definition of x1, which was x0 plus delta, I get this uh, formula for x1 in terms of x0. And that is the, the, how, uh, that is the Newton method, basically. So starting from x0, I calculate this new x1. And then I can repeat or iterate. This is an iterative method. I'm going to take the x1 and put it in the same formula and get out the next estimate x2, etc. So in general, I have xn plus 1 is xn minus f of xn divided by f prime of xn. And that is the one-dimensional Newton method. So it's pretty easy to implement that in Julia, as long as you have this you know, nice forward diff package to calculate the derivative for you, or you can implement it by hand, which will be in a, a problem set later in the course, how to uh, do, you know, doing finite differences that Alan has already showed. So here's my starting point 37, and I'm going to create a vector that starts off with just that point. And then I'm going to do this iteration in a for loop. And there's minus equals, I'm not sure we've actually mentioned that yet, just means uh, so x minus equals a is the same as writing x equals x minus a, but it it just you know prevents prevents me from having to repeat the name of the variable. So it's actually more readable because it tells you oh you're going to you know, update the value of x by subtracting from it a. So if you have a long variable name and you write it out twice, it's, you don't necessarily you can't necessarily tell visually if those Two names are actually the same. Okay, and then we're going to return x. So that's just exactly what I just said. We're just going to iterate, you know, repeat this, um, this, this step basically. And so when I do that, and I pass in this anonymous function x squared minus two with my initial condition thirty-seven, what do I get? I get this, this value, and that is almost exactly the same as the square root of two that Julia gives. And in fact. Um, how do you implement square root two on a computer? It actually ends up doing a Newton method at the end, uh, exactly like this, just a couple of steps. So you start off with a very good approximation and then you clean it, you sort of refine it with a Newton method. Okay. So, so what, do, what, does, what does that all tell us? It tells us how to actually solve a one dimensional nonlinear equation. And uh, you know, to, to find the inverse that I was talking about. So, uh, so what about in two dimensions? That's a, kind of, uh, it's a bit harder. Uh, so, 
we're going to try doing the same thing. So I, I defined a transformation T, uh, sorry, I, I'm a bit lost in where, where that got defined. Oh, it's here. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's my transformation, the same nonlinear transformation that Alan was using. T of alpha is this x plus alpha y squared and y plus alpha x squared. So it's a transformation that takes a vector in two dimensions to a vector in two dimensions. And uh, you that's know, the one that gave you two heads. Yeah. So when alpha is zero, it's just the identity transformation. It just leaves everything the same. As alpha changes, it deforms things. And so here I've taken, for example, the input 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and we can see the output 0 0.311 and 0 0.40. And then what I've done is, as Alan did, the inverse of this function uh, you know, at, at 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And so that's sort of the opposite transformation. And then I, I, I um, took this composition of the function and of the map and its inverse. And that sends it back to the same place. So how do I calculate this inverse using the Newton method in two dimensions now? So let's look at two dimensions. I'm trying to solve the equation for a map t from r squared to r squared, I'm trying to solve this equation t of x equals y. So somebody gives me y and I need to find x. So let's do exactly the same thing as we did in one dimension. And first of all, let's look at it symbolically. So here's my map t. I have this parameter p that uh, is currently zero. So it's currently the identity transformation. So if I apply that to the vector a plus delta and b plus epsilon, I get a plus delta and b plus epsilon back symbolically because I'm doing, uh, these are all symbols. And now um, if I ask forward diff, what the Jacobian of this map is, is just the identity transformation that is going to leave all the vectors the same. And so um, I can actually do that. Uh, yeah, and then the linear part is, you know, take that matrix and multiply it by the vector delta and epsilon. And that gives me just delta and epsilon back. And so when I subtract, just like I did um, with the, just like I did in one dimension, when I subtract these two, because currently the map is just a linear map, when I subtract these two, I actually get zero and zero. But now I'm going to change P to 0 0.1, say. And um, what happens? So now I'm doing a nonlinear transformation, the one I, I said, uh, which was you know, uh, uh, X plus alpha squared, alpha times y squared and y plus alpha times x squared. That is t of x and y. And so now, what happens? Well, when I do, um, is that working correctly? Yeah, so this, sorry. So th this is just take T of P and apply it to A plus delta and B plus epsilon and then expand everything. And so, you know, we're just squaring things. And so you just get, you know, um, um, we're evaluating at A plus delta and we're squaring y, so we're squaring b plus epsilon, so we get b squared plus epsilon squared plus 2b times epsilon, and all of that is multiplied by the 0 0.1. And it doesn't seem to be expanding correctly. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, if this is going to work. Well, it seems to be working. So the Jacobian, this is the symbolic Jacobian, again, using forward diff. And this is what happens when you multiply that Jacobian by the vector delta epsilon. So this is the, the sort of linear part of the map. And now, oh dear, can't see anything there. And now um, this is the linear, uh, what is that now? Yeah, I, it's not managing to simplify in the right way, but well, okay, when I actually manage to simplify in the right way, I'm subtracting the image of, so this is T of P applied to a plus delta and b plus epsilon minus the, the map applied at the original point. So again, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm trying to apply it at the point a, b and apply it at a nearby point to delta and epsilon are perturbations of a and b in the x and y directions. And then this is the linear part. And when I subtract the linear part from the total thing, I get just the parts of the expression which have these nonlinear terms. 
So again, what, what is the derivative in two dimensions doing? It's also just sort of removing these nonlinear parts and just giving me a linear approximation to the function. So we can actually see that you know, uh, symbolically. So almost run out of time. So we do the same thing in two dimensions with, with Newton. And what we end up needing to do is this delta, instead of becoming, instead of being just a step in one dimension, is now a step in two dimensions. And to find it, we actually need to solve this system of linear equations. And so we need to invert this matrix J. I would say that the big takeaway, if you can see it, is that the two-dimensional one and the one-dimensional one are really the same. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. kind of the grown-up version because instead of dividing, you apply the inverse, but it's, it's really right. the same. And if you see that, then you, you know, then you're a real expert at, at, at yeah. solving systems. So there's this strange uh, notation backslash for, uh, for basically solving this system of linear equations, J times delta equals T of X. Let's solve J times delta equals T of X. Okay, and um, so just to finish, so that's also relatively easy to implement, just like this, and then um, and that's 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 exactly. Oh, and then we need to define the actual inverse function, and to do that, um, we need to apply Newton. Newton looks for uh, solutions of you know something equals zero, g of x equals zero, and so we actually want the solution of f of x equals y. So basically, we're going to define g of x to be f of x minus y. And then when, you know, uh, when g of x equals zero, f of x is equal to y. So it's the same thing I started off with. And so we're just calling Newton to find a root of this equation. And the root of that equation is a value of x such that f of x equals y. And that is exactly what we mean by the inverse of f and y. And then we define the inverse of a function as this anonymous function taking y to the inverse of f evaluated at the point y. And that is exactly what Alan showed actually applying to the images. So the point is, just to finish, that um, you know, we cannot necessarily invert functions analytically. We cannot ne necessarily find an actual expression for the inverse function. But even, even so, computationally, we can always try to use Newton to find the inverse function if it actually exists. Okay, we're, we're doing office hours at four o'clock today, uh, yep. even if people hear this later. And we should say goodbye to the folks in internet land. And I'm also gonna have to disappear now too. So uh, Dave, can you make sure that the uh, YouTube is shut off? Yeah. Okay, bye everybody. All right, bye-bye.